Aloha, everybody. Hmm. Good to see everybody. Hmm. Aloha. Aloha. Take the time to look around, see who's with us today. Huh. Hey. <laughs> A lot of time zones. <laughs> Amazing. Mm. I think we've got a lot of time zones covered. <laughs> Japan, Thailand, Europe, North America. Wow, it's wonderful. All right, well, let's get started. Finding your connection to your seated posture. Letting the eyes come to close. Noticing whatever is predominant in this range of physicality that we receive in the body. Noticing the quality of mind that is receiving and knowing. Sensitive to the change, movement, and dynamism. Of just this relationship. between mentality and materiality. As it appears now and in this moment, in this moment. Of course, we know that hearing is happening, seeing is happening, smelling, tasting, and this wild range of experience through the body This wilder and wider range of mental, emotional phenomena. And 
all real, all worthy of our attention, our care. And while we recognize how important it is to be able to train the attention at any of these sense doors and at times move fluidly, skillfully between them. It's always important also to remember the value of using a primary anchor, gathering the attention in one place. beyond preference, especially when there is a lot of activity in the mind, activity in our lives, choices, dynamics of wanting and not wanting, the renunciation of simply observing the breath, for example. And it's beautiful, simple, refreshing, relieving at times. And so the encouragement at this point in this sitting, not in denial of all the other phenomena arising and passing throughout our sense experiences, but just settling into the sensations around the abdomen general area as the breath moves in and out on its own. Noticing the rising and falling. The rising at the in-breath falling through the out-breath. The spaces in between. Where we may not notice much at all. The sensations may be very vague, maybe subtle, maybe clear, maybe strong. And tightening, increasing tension, releasing, decreasing tension. They may be very specific in a well-defined area. They may be more general, this abdominal region of our bodies. I'm not needing to search for anything in particular. not needing to bring mental tension, force, just an aliveness and persistence, dedication, to simple observation of these moving, changing 
physical sensations. Images may arise, thoughts may arise, preferences, and phenomena at other sense doors will arise, may call the attention clearly. And we can acknowledge them, receive them, be aware of them. study them in the same way. But rather than follow them, or follow the next, to the next, to the next, today this encouragement to simply return to the breath. What is it that's so enchanting about these thoughts, these ideas, these other experiences? so compelling. You can feel the heart, mind. Long towards something else. More interesting, more exciting. More affirming of ourselves, our identities our structure, and with compassion, notice that. The stability that it provides momentarily, but also the strain, the dukkha. And what is it like to simply return to the breath? Noticing in more detail, impersonal, mundane, material. Of course, if you know the breath is not a viable anchor for you, use what is familiar in terms of sound or other parts of the body. But the encouragement is the same. Just stay with one thing. Let go of the entertainment the busyness, the chatter. Notice it. Feel the compassion for the mind that longs for that kind of protection, satisfaction. and trusting the deeper stability in this island of renunciation, of contentment, and peace. following through the full rising, the full falling, nothing to do, gain, achieve, attain. It's the acknowledgement of the real, the truth. Of this phenomenon moving, changing, 
existing, disappearing.
It looks like we may have lost Steve temporarily. He's no, he's there. He's on. Oh, is he? He's on my page three, but I don't know if that correlates oh, to yeah, your. Oh yeah, there he is. Okay, great. Yeah. Nexus. I don't know how he ended up way over there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and you can't move him, right? That doesn't oh, no. work. No. Okay. Well, here we are. The mystery. The mystery of the quilt. <laughs> I'll stand. Uh, there's a, a Pali word for meditation, which uh, is bhavana. As I was taught it, uh, the translation uh, means bhavana means giving that meditation is giving birth to wisdom. And I've always appreciated that translation, giving birth to wisdom. And there's a um, way that that's described as um, waking up from a deep sleep. And I think that the path of giving birth to wisdom, um, <clears throat> it's, it's so many things. It's, it's calm, it's, it can be dangerous, it can be joyful, it, peaceful, wild, boring, everything. It's like, it's meant to be that um, we get a relationship of wise attention. We're giving birth to, to wise attention in our relationship with whatever appears. Uh, and I think of um, that light as a, it's like the, the, the spark of wisdom, the, the, like a warmth in this galaxy that we live in, um, the warmth of awakening from sleep. So, so this bhavana, giving birth to wisdom, it's not only inclusive of, more and more inclusive of how things are, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, but also the Brahma Viharas, uh, the practice of them, the, in, the inclusion of the practice, the practices of the Brahma Viharas also allows for the heart mind to be soft enough to be with things as they are. And so this um, path of bhavana or a path of cultivating love and wisdom um, goes along side by side. So this giving birth to wisdom, uh, awakening from sleep, is, is really shifting how we're trained to perceive reality. Uh, so we tend to be trained to believe only conceptual reality or conventional reality. And this is a, 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 a shift in training um, to learn how to access wise attention, wise kind attention. So the Dhamma is truth. It's invisible, but palpable, and we can apprehend it or access it by learning how to connect our attention with the non-conceptual reality, the sixth, or sixth sense door moment to moment flow of awareness. And um, it's, so, it's so hard sometimes for us because we tend to be figure things out through going through our thought process. And this is not how the birth of wisdom happens. It doesn't happen through our thought process. So it comes from being with our experience with wise attention. So of course, we talk about sati or mindfulness um, as 
like the warp of the great weaving of bhavana. It's um, translated by Suzuki Roshi as soft readiness that that but we think of we can think of mindfulness as an awareness infused with wisdom so it's not any old awareness it's it's a quality of awareness that's infused with wisdom and it's it's in within that wisdom of course is the understanding of anicca dukkha anatta it's um So to call it soft readiness, the readiness to understand that anything can happen, of course, comes from understanding that experience is impermanent. It's an unreliable and not controllable, the anicca, dukkha, anatta. The second factor of awakening uh, investigation uh, is, is kind of a, a going from this awareness, the soft readiness um, to a certain uh, pitch. It's like a, it's a clarity of observation. And whether we're observing reality from the, within it, from the inside of experience, or if we're observing reality from the outside of experience, um, the kind of birth of investigation, it's, it's the Buddha described it as if we've gone for a com from a completely dark room to a light, a light came on. It's that powerful. It's part of the waking up that happens in this um, bhavana practice. So often that the experience of that will, will, will feel like there's a shift to being interested in what's happening right now free from concept so that we might be noticing the breath or, or sound or our foot stepping or we're tasting something it, it doesn't matter what it is um, <clears throat> but there's a kind of humility and honesty that is free from memory so for example you can maybe see my hand in the little quilt of faces um, hand the word hand is is a memory well of course we use concept to help us direct the attention um, but then it's like the investigation allows us to really inquire like to really inquire non-conceptually like and get close as we can to like what is this experience like free from memory it's it's so it, there's something so beautiful and powerful about it because it's so honest. It's completely honest. What exactly is appearing moment by moment without the words? That's 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 this. That's it. So that allows for what's actually there. It's not like you're making anything happen with investigation. It allows for um, uh, it to like light up the, the, what these newborn moments, the aliveness of reality. There's a, there's a moment and it's gone. There's another moment, it's gone. So therefore that there's that saying by the Greek philosopher Heraclitus that you cannot step in the same stream ever. There's no moment that's ever the same and it's always new and dying, birth, death, birth, death. And it's flowing so fast, so fast. So of course, there's a way in which concept or conventional reality brings a certain kind of security <laughs> that we, we don't have to see how fast everything is moving. But to remember that this includes all words like the word fear or the word happiness or the word breath or the word thought or whatever's appearing, it's this ability of the attention to connect with what's happening without going through the thought process. It's called the direct experience, experiential reality. And in, in you can't make anything happen, but there is a way in which we understand that as we um, can, e it's, 
it's like you jump into this fast moving stream. If you think of a fast moving stream and you jump into it, you're in this flow of aliveness. Um, and if you're in it, um, and even if it's for a few seconds, then this insight, this, this understanding can appear not through the thought process of understanding of being connected with a Nietzsche impermanence or connected with dukkha with the unreliability of experience because it's changing and the uncontrollability of experience because it's it's changing you you it's a fast moving stream uh, The, the Buddha also taught that 100% of the holy life of this bhavana practice is friendship. You know, so we, it's like when you bring together like with this description of just bhavana and then to see that also he's saying 100% of this is Dhamma friendship, that, that this, the Sangha is like the sacred container for the birth of wisdom. You have to have a container, right, for birth. Birth of the Brahma, of metta or compassion, kindness, peace. So we share, we share this bhavana practice as Dhamma friends. And I think it's, it's amazing to understand, if we understand that there can be such gratitude just to, for me, just for the Sunday sittings, that there's like a awe and a reverence of sharing this together. I think it might have been a month ago, but I was walking outside at night and um, I heard of I've heard of fireballs, but I've never seen one. Um, and I'm getting old. <laughs> you know? And I, I, I saw this fireball and it happens quicker than you can say a layers of fireball, right? It's like this huge, like big thing. You know, it's, it's an unusual, it's described as an, an unusually bright metaphor, but the, the head of it is um, very big and uh, it, it moved in the sky horizontally. It was just above the uh, horizon. It was moving right to left across the, the sky. It's considered very rare to see it, but I must say like, it's amazing. And yet it lasted, it lasted shorter than me being able to say fireball. <laughs> you know, that's pretty, that's amazing. And that's like kind of like what we teach about a moment of experience. And that's why it's it's we say it's so insubstantial or it or it's sometimes called empty. It's because it's really when you're really paying attention, you're only seeing the end of things and they're they're just going like a shooting star like that. It's that fast. This is a, a D. H. Lawrence poem about lightning. It's called Storm in the Black Forest. Now it is almost night from the bronzy soft sky, jugful after jugful of pure white liquid fire, bright white, tipples over, spills down, and is gone. Now in a way, that's many words for the word lightning, yeah? But yeah, it's like liquid fire tippling over and spilling down and is gone. So we have these brief moments where we actually are connected and we're aware of that level of sensitivity to the aliveness. I think that Thich Nhat Hanh described it so beautifully. Beautifully, the rhythm of my heart 
is the birth and death of all that is alive. Just you think of your heart, mind that way. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I um, turned 71 today and um, yeah, 71. And I was born dead. I know some of you know that, but I was born dead. And every time I like live another year, I'm always like, wow, that's like awesome. Like I just, I wasn't, I didn't have a lot going for me, you know, at that, at that point. And um, I think that so sick as a kid, and you know, in some ways people will think, oh, Shell has a weak immune system, but in a way it's like, wow, you know, still happening, still alive, but it sort of, of course, it affected me in the way of like, um, different from other people, a lot of people I knew, and that I was aware of mortality and so aware of how fleeting it is and so aware of like how you know you never know you never know how old you're going to get it's um it there's sort of this immense gratitude for life joy and sorrow nibbana kindness the dhamma and the whole practice what i love about it is srinasargadatta said I was never born and I will never die. Don't accuse me of being born and don't accuse me of dying. So we go from the personal self, right? To the impersonal self. There was never a personal self, right? It never was, it won't be, it isn't. And yet we often are, are moving from that awareness of the conventional reality to the deeper truth that thoughts, emotions, body sensations, like it's just coming and going by itself. We glue it together to, to make a personal self that takes birth, lives and dies. And, and I think it again that like there's that level of um, how we how important it is in terms of the bhavana path to see how we yearn for and and often are trying to find security in the personal self of ourselves or another where there isn't the change, where there isn't the unreliability, where there isn't the uncontrollability. If you look at a lot of our suffering, so much of it comes from that trying to make something permanent that isn't permanent or trying to make something reliable that isn't reliable you know, or trying to make something controllable that isn't. And it, it, it's like we need to have great compassion for that yearning. If we don't, it, it's not safe to explore. And often, if you look at when we're thinking a lot, we're, it's, if you look carefully at it, it's like when we do that, there's a way that we're slowing reality down. We're just trying to slow things down and stop them. We're trying to make something glued together into form that's actually insubstantial or evanescent. And what's wonderful about having time to practice and to, to have the sacred container, like, to, uh, like a sacred um, cocoon to, to be protected enough to explore this, uh, that we'll see that if we jump into this fast moving stream, which we would call life, <laughs> of, of sense, the six sense doors flowing along. Um, when we're going along, sometimes you'll see how you, you'll kind of come up out of the stream, your head will bop up and like look around because it wants the security again. It's like it doesn't want to be in that fast moving stream. Um, 
and there's no judgment. It's fine. You pop up, you look around, you can pop down in whenever you want, right? You, you start learning some control in that process of not feeling like you're trapped. Although ultimately we are in the fast moving stream. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it is. That's the truth. So in when we are going along in that sixth sense door awareness, even, you know, it can be with the breath. The breath is moving. It's not still. It can be with the anchor. The sound is moving. It, it doesn't have to be just the flow. It, everything that we appears is moving. You see, you understand that attachment actually isn't possible. And that, that, that the liberation with that, the freedom that for, from that is such a relief. It doesn't mean that we might not, of course, grasp on again or grasp on again, um, but it's to, to allow that, to see that sense of like we tighten around things, we grab on, we push away the unpleasant, we grab onto the pleasant, we get confused by the neutral. Uh, and it's, it's just the more you start trying to step back and understand rather than to judge it. You start understanding and having more compassion, kindness, and more free. Well, this, this quotation by Sri Nazaragadatta, I haven't read a lot, but I, I think it's so important in relationship to Bhavana. The question to him, was pain is not acceptable. I guess you'd say pain is not acceptable. <laughs> it's a question. Is pain acceptable? And Nizargadatta said, why not? Did you ever try? Do try and you will find in pain a joy which pleasure cannot yield for the simple reason that acceptance of pain takes you much deeper than pleasure does. This is so important. It's simply because acceptance of pain takes you much deeper than pleasure does. The personal self by its very nature is constantly pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. The ending of this pattern is the ending of the personal self. So this doesn't mean that we don't pace this and that if we're overwhelmed by pain that we don't, as you've heard us say, we t teach to back off to, to at times even really search out the neutral or the pleasure for a balance, but it's to understand that the acceptance of pain, even when we move away from it, if we can't um, work with the aversion to the pain, there are times when you, 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 with all the kindness, with the motivation, with kindness and metta that you can muster, you move away, but you understand that. My oldest sister uh, had a rough, rough life and she's five years older than me. And she's now is mostly, she doesn't drive. Um, she's mostly, you know, in a chair in her home and in a room at her daughter's home. And uh, for some years she's, she's been so, immobile she started to be able to walk recently a bit which is so wonderful um but she's she's um appreciated the solitude and the quiet that she's discovered in her old old life you know she it's been She's appreciated it. I've been really um, moved by her shifting into this and appreciating it. And um, there's been some family stuff happening and somebody is moving into the house that um, 
is not going to make for peace and quiet. <laughs> and um, I talked with her yesterday morning and she said, the only thing I have left is my peace and quiet and it's going away. And I was like, oh, you know, this is the time if she was interested in the practice, it would be the time to talk about it. But it it's too much. So I just have to kind of encourage her to, um, I told her, you know, lock your door. Like, you, can you lock your door? Yeah. So like, okay, so there's times where you're going to lock your door and only like move, allow this being into your room if you feel like you can cope with this. And she's like, really, I can do that? And I'm like, yeah, you can lock your door and still have some peace and quiet. And so that's, you know, it's so interesting how for us, of course, in the process of discussing it, I would say the aversion is what's disturbing the peace and quiet, right? That this is a big change, the aversion to the change and not being able to control your situation is disturbing the peace. Um, but, but for now, she needs the protection of the cocoon, yeah? And so that's what's so interesting is like, how do we navigate our lives? If I were her, I'd have a hard time. Too. <laughs> and so, but it's like, I would understand more deeply why I was suffering in it. And it's, does, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I meet her where she is and how it's happening for her. And it's hard. We, you know, we have this idea how we're going to be when we're old and what kind of control we're going to have over our lives, but we don't always have it. Yeah. And so that it's been really a teaching for me for, for to be with her through this process and to try to be as helpful as I can. Hmm. Wherever we live on the planet, winter is uh, usually has its challenges, uh, but different where where each each of us lives. And where I live, it's um, it's the wind. And a, a couple of weeks ago, where where I live, there were sixty three sixty three miles per hour winds, and uh, one of the trees in my yard went down. And uh, big tree, it was very sad. And uh, just <laughs> two days ago, we had 70 miles per hour winds, which is really intense, um, 70 mile, miles per hour winds. And this other tree, this big tree next to it fell down. So it's just like, wow, just um, like that, right? One gust, one gust will cause it. Uh, and it fell across the fence, smashed the fence. And this time it went across the road. So cars couldn't go through. It was to me, it was like, oh, no. like, oh, no, I'm I'm like responsible for this. Like nobody can drive through the road. Right. It's just like, wow, like Anicca, right? <laughs> Anicca Dukkha Anatta. Um, but I, fe I felt that, you know, usually with those nights when it's the winds are that strong you know nobody's sleeping in the neighborhood and the houses are shaking and rattling and um but who thinks of the feral cats right but of course i have three feral cats and they're uh, seeing them the next morning i just wonder how do they do it how do they manage it because for them it's it's so hard because that's when predators can get them when they can't hear and the 70 mile per hour wind is crazy. So it's, I just like this one, one of them like came out and they all, they, they hardly ever whimper or cry. They all kind of emerged and they were whimpering or crying. And I looked in their eyes and it's like, so it was so hard to bear. It was so clear. It was so hard to bear. And I think winter is is like that. In some level, wherever any of us live, it's like there's this these experiences that um, teach us 
that the acceptance of pain takes us much deeper than pleasure does. You could see it as kind of a, it's seasonal, but it's also part of life. You know, when you have these times in life that are very difficult, it's like um, how much we learn if we can. The other day in this great um, desert place of a drought, there was a little rainstorm, not a big rainstorm, but a little one. And there, um, there's this, I've talked about this puddle that happens rarely on the road. And it wasn't a big puddle. It was a little puddle. <laughs> and when I saw it, my first, my first thought was, this puddle is too small. I don't have time for this. <laughs> I had such arrogance. It was amazing. It was like, the last time it rained, it was a much bigger puddle. And it was, in my mind, so much more interesting. And this puddle was so shallow and it was so small. But then I remembered um, the Zen teacher, the great Zen teacher, Dogen, said, the whole moon, and the entire sky are reflected in one dewdrop on the grass. One dewdrop, the, the whole universe, right, is reflected in one dewdrop. That is a, that's a metaphor for awakening, enlightenment, that this one complete moment of being so fully present with wisdom, right? So that it's like, so here I am not having time for this little puddle. So I decided to stop and um, it took more time. I was standing there and it like, it didn't, it hardly moved at all because it was so shallow and I'm standing there and then, you know, gradually seeing a tree and seeing clouds in it. And um, this dragonfly came and I think the dragonfly also had a kind of sense like this, this puddle's too small for me, but it like came along and I could hear its wings. And then I looked and the, the dragonfly just hung out right by my ear um, for a long time, just kind of hovering. And the sound was so amazing. And I thought, oh, um, quiet, quiet puddle friend. Yeah, puddle dragonfly, puddle friends really powerful. It's all a matter of taking the time. You might try to rush through the breakfast or rush through dinner or rush through the dishes or, you know, it's that sense of like how we're operating. And then suddenly you can feel the warmth of the water when you're doing the dishes, if you have warm water, right? Uh, or you play with the soap and the movement. Uh, it's, it's all just, it doesn't matter what the experience is that we wake up to. It's how we're relating to it again and again. The, the the line the line from the metta chant suki atanam pariharantu remembering to experience the goodness of taking care of yourself and others at this time of year particularly can be um, additional stress through the holidays whether you're participating in it or not that um, that if you just remember that line. Sukiyatanam Pariharantu. Appreciating the goodness of taking care of myself or others, taking care of others. Or the word apamada, apamada, very simple, very one word. Carefulness, 
carefulness. When you see a, a multitude of humans not being careful, you can actually stop and be careful. It doesn't, it just takes remembering. It's the opposite of carelessness. It's just a slight pause. And it's really that taking care of the preciousness of life. I think that the karma for me of my birth was at times being able to appreciate how precious life is, even when you get old. <laughs> So I'd like to end with a poem from Pablo, Pablo Neruda's Autumn Testament, translated by Alastair Reed. So of course, it's one of the last poems he wrote. And now I'm going behind this page but not disappearing. I'll dive into clear air like a summer in the sky and then go back to growing till one day I'm so small that the wind will take me away and I won't know my name and I won't be there when I wake. Then. I will sing in the silence. Mm -hmm. Oh, do I need to ring a bell? So if you have any question. Hi, son. Let's see, can you unmute? Yeah. Happy birthday, Michelle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I remember like one time I read, this lady said that she, her body is 80 years old, but somehow her mind feels like she's still a teenager. Did you, Did you feel, feel like, like she was a wise person or a deluded person? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my question is that, so the <laughs> mind and the body is uh, different. The body may go on, but the, the mind, like some young people, like 20, can act like 40 or 50 years old too. Well, there's, there's good old karma, karma, <laughs> which is really determining a lot more than our age. So, you know, the, there's some beings that are just in here. You have that feeling that they're really, 
aware of so many lifetimes and others that don't aren't aware of that right like it's a different quality of understanding of karma which i think determines a lot more about how we relate to age but it, there's nothing like thinking about age when you're 40 and being 80 <laughs> I must say, being 71 is very different than being 28. I mean, it's really, I find it incredibly different, you know. And I also feel like my mind is different from practice. So I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking. What are you asking? Like, time doesn't that really seem to matter because like some 70 years on people can ne we never learn <laughs> <laughs> and would act like with no wisdom like a teenager i was just having a conversation with a yogi doing a self-retreat yesterday and her um her mom was extremely troubled, very troubled, and not no longer alive. But and um, it was when this woman was much younger. She was talking about it though, and she went to a social worker for help. And um, the social worker said to her, um, "Well, she." she had been describing her mother and the social worker said um, please be aware that your mother can't change much because she's so damaged and i thought that was such a compassionate thing to have said to this yogi it's like you know usually people there's reasons why they're not able to change sometimes it's not as visible than others but there's a karma to it and um, if you think about how lucky we are if we can change <laughs> like the for the good fortune of it there's so many beings who cannot and um, so that it is it sometimes it's very difficult to accept it accept it but it's it's a kind of way things can unfold for people you know sometimes it doesn't look like people that can't change are suffering <laughs> so, and, some, and that's when it's harder i think when people are having a great time and you think they should be changing but they're, they're not <laughs> so like Age doesn't guarantee wisdom. That's that's for sure. So, like when I think of Donald Trump, I wonder if he, if he would done something. When you think of <laughs> I didn't Donald Trump, oh the long term, right? Well, how do you feel, son? Do you feel the same as when you were 16? Yeah, because I, I, I think like I try to, um, to learn. So I feel like, <laughs> I hope it's not the um, delusion, but I, I do feel that I'm a much wiser than when I was 20 or 40. But I have to take a test. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> I'm not so sure, but I think there's a little bit more wisdom than when, I, when I'm in my 30s or 40s, now that I'm 76, four more years and 80. <laughs> it's so hard to self-evaluate, I think, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's such a powerful question, really, you know, I mean, I, I think about it some it occurs to me frequently you know 
I think before my teenage years, I can't, I have a hard time kind of relating to whoever, that, you know, a 10 year old version of me or a six year old version. But as a teenager, there's something that feels very familiar, you know, to who I am now. And of course things have changed. And what if that is wisdom or is like unbinding and untangling of certain things? What is that maybe of deepening some other entanglements you know i mean it, it's very complex you know we're very complex systems you know and i think about that sutta i think michelle read it uh, sometime recently about the buddha you know the ananda saying to him look at you've you know your skin is flabby and your seeing is bad and your faculties have all diminished you know but he actually doesn't mention the mind faculty um Maybe actually Quinn meant pointed that out, you know, and it's true. You go look at it and it's like, he's just talking about the other six sense, the other five sense doors. And of course the, the, the belief or the, you know, tradition is to say that the awakening of the Buddha didn't diminish and his mental faculties didn't diminish. Um, but I think we only have our own minds and those around us, you know, that we have to, to have a sense of that. I think Srinivasagadatta is an interesting example of someone who, you know, he still smoked BDs, you know, his whole life. And I think that the other piece is like, we can't have a projection of a fantasy of who we are as like fully enlightened. Doesn't mean that all the parts of ourselves that we don't like necessarily go away, you know, or that aren't wise, or it's like, maybe there's just patterns that just stick around because they're natural and you don't have to change them. You don't have to get rid of them. You don't have to feel like you need to become the person you want to be in order to, what, what is the arahantship really like? You know, I mean, there are stories of like that, of course, in the suttas where people could become free, but they weren't all just like the same exact bland person, you know, the elements of personality were still there and patterns of behavior were still there. And it doesn't mean that they weren't also free, you know? So in some ways it's like, you also, I think we can't judge our progress or, you know, yeah, progress, you know, always just in the same ways that we, we tend to evaluate things, you know? But it's good to feel maybe we're a little wiser. <laughs> At least we know what not to do. <laughs> yeah a big deal that, i mean really son that's huge i mean i think that understanding how and why we suffer is so huge you wouldn't <laughs> want to minimize it you know you know how you know people will somebody's dog will die and people will say you know to that person you know when are you going to get another dog you know when are you going to replace that dog and <laughs> I remember a friend of mine said, you know, I can't really replace this dog. Like, it's, I don't feel like getting a new dog for a while. Like, I really have to, like, you know, deal with this. Like, and I feel like that's important to know about our, the word diversity, the level of diversity within each moment, never mind between us all and, um, it, it we are unique and we are going to die i mean we aren't replaceable <laughs> that that's what's so painful if if we were if we were all like each other if there was if everything was the same it wouldn't be so difficult but it, there is a uniqueness to our karma and beings that um i think that's why aliveness in life is so precious because we we are here to appreciate it to be grateful for it but um, it doesn't last. That's what the paradox of it all is hard to bear, but it, it is something important to remember that um, as Jesse says, it's like you, you don't become like everything else if you wake up. You still have the same old karmic knots. And the same old, you know, you, you have to, in other words, we have to live out our karma. The Buddha had to live out his karma. Everybody has to live. Out. If you're born a human, you can't undo that. You've got to live that karma out.
can't get the remote out and replace my parents with other parents, right? You can't like do that. You can't, you can't like, I can't change my laugh to somebody else's laugh or you know, the whole thing. It's just like, uh, it's a karma package. And we all have unpleasant aspects to ourselves and pleasant aspects and neutral as anybody we live with will point out <laughs> if they're honest. At least we may be more comfortable with ourselves, hopefully. That's a big one, yeah, acceptance. Hmm. Thanks, son. <laughs> Richard? You could hear me? This is about impermanence in our hands. Michelle started talking and starting talking today about uh, our hands as a concept versus them as being real. And I'm learning about my hands because I'm learning to play the classical guitar. And I do see the impermanence of the fact that every day is a different day. And some days I'm very good and some days I'm very bad. And, but still there are, I'm able to develop skills and learn about them because I follow certain rules. Like I'm, I know which joint to bend on my right hand, or I, I know where to put my thumb with, on my left hand. And, it, and I, so I, I don't think this impermanence extends to like, to the point of being total anarchy as if every day is just totally different than every other day. And we can't, you know, if we knew how to walk to the store yesterday, we won't know how to walk to the store tomorrow. So I guess my question is, you know, how do you develop skills in this world of, not everything can be changing, I guess that's what I'm saying. I don't think the idea that just it is always changing everything actually definitely is always changing, but that doesn't mean there aren't patterns, you know, and it doesn't mean there's no chaos. In fact, that's very much the point of the teachings is that it's not chaos right that that actions have results that are sort of dependable or predictable to some degree, you know, often based on the motivating force, you know, so. Um, you know, familiarity and learning new things and being able to function in the world and cook, learn a new recipe or learn a new skill, you know, those are all real for sure. I think the question of you know, where are we living? You know, are we only living in the world of the concept or are we living in the world of the direct experience of our hand, right? And the direct experience of the sensations of physicality is different, you know? And so when you play your instrument, you know, then you close your eyes as you're especially, you know, trying to learn. It's like, are you still, are you feeling the fretboard directly and the sensations there? Or do you, can you also see the place where you're imagining your fingers on the fretboard, a visual impression there, right? And, and so no one's saying that, that that isn't useful, but there's a way in which you can see how if we're only living in the conceptual version of experience, that that's, you know, very, it can be very functional, you know, and it gives us a platform to operate on every single level. And it doesn't necessarily teach us about the nature of reality, you know, on the deeper levels, that's all. And so this practice and the teachings are not a rejection of the value or the truth of um, 
you know, this kind of agreed upon reality, you know, and the, the conceptual and the, and the repetitive nature of it. <laughs> for sure. You know, I mean, that's the, that's what they call samsara, right? The cycles of, of continued existence and the repetition of it is part of what can be, feel so oppressive, you know? Um, uh, and so rather than, you know, the, the, to, to, to use the mind to create beautiful things and to create beautiful sounds and to offer these things and, to, you know, create goodness in the world. It's, it's wonderful. And to also recognize that it's a different process than the, the process of untangling the mind from enchantment with beautiful things or f fascination with terrible things or fear. And, you know, the, it's, it's, we're learning to play, it's like the instrument of the mind, right? And do we know when to apply investigation, when to apply energy, when to, you know, it's like these other skills that we're learning that are direct, right? That are not conceptual um, is the maybe kind of corollary piece of, of what you're describing, yeah. But I don't, I don't think anyone would say things aren't often repetitive, you know? But you very well may forget how to walk around the store tomorrow. And if you, if that happens, is in your whole sense of security is lost in that, then that is not a strong kind of understand. That is not wisdom, right? That's like a certain kind of knowledge that's functional when conditions are functioning in a certain way. And when those conditions fall away, what you have is to what degree you've cultivated equanimity, patience, kindness, acceptance, right? These other things that, uh, that can maintain regardless if the, you forget how to do anything or if the store collapses or changes or the world around you shifts in ways that are unpredicted, you know, that that's the promise of the practice is the freedom of of the stability outside of the changing conditions yeah michelle so if i have a, a itch an itch on my cheek right now and i I'm not aware. I'm not aware of the intention to scratch, and I'm not aware of the movement, the sensations up to, to scratching. Right um, from the outside, you couldn't tell if I had an understanding of anatta with that or not. You you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, so if I was learning how to do something, <laughs> if say if I was learning how to play guitar right now, which I've never done, it would take a while to learn how to do it. And usually when we're learning how to do something, we're not maybe as skilled with <laughs> bringing our um, wisdom with that movement of whatever we're doing. But hopefully it would appear sometimes because of a lot of practice. So it's a lot of, it's just... Um, just like you're describing getting good at playing guitar, it's just the same with learning how to be mindful. And the skill is meant to increase so that when whatever you do, um, you're not an expert. You're just like the idea that you're an expert at anything goes. It's like, you know, it's just that that pausing and being able to be very fully with the experience of whatever's happening with wisdom, right? It has, so it, it's, um, you're describing something where usually if we just, it's always good to try to learn something new because it's very humbling, right? You know, it's just, you, you know, it takes a lot of practice and skill at it, but it doesn't mean that you can never be mindful until you get good at it. Like it just, that's not true. But it probably is true that for most of us, it would be hard. It's, it's like I heard um, Jesse told me that Yo-Yo Ma was out on uh, the Hokalea the other day out in the ocean near where we lived. Now, I would guess that when Yo-Yo Ma plays his instrument, 
he's so good at it that if he knew how to be mindful, he'd probably be able to play it and be mindful because those two skills would come together, maybe. But I'm not assuming that he's mindful when he's playing because I don't know, right? I don't know if he has practiced to that point of um, mastery. So I think it's just a matter of, you can learn how to be mindful doing the dishes. If you keep practicing it over and over, which is obviously one of the things I try to practice and I still don't think I'm that good at it, <laughs> but it's like, I intend when I get there to do it, but it's like, um, it takes a conscious like effort, get in the car. You can drive mindful and unmindfully all the way to the store, but if you practice, you, you get better at it, hopefully. So um, I don't see that, it, like Jesse said, I don't think you can separate these two things um, so dramatically. Um, I think that mindfulness is really like a matter of remembering remembering how to have a certain quality of awareness with what what's happening. I have a, um, I always wear physical therapists out. Like I, I wear them out. Um, there's certain things going on with my body that are all karmic knots and they usually just kind of fizzle out. Um, but I have a new physical therapist that I think he's determined to like help me. I, f I feel kind of bad for him. And uh, the other day, you'll love this. He said, Michelle, when you walk, please don't think about it. Don't think about it. Walk unmindfully. Walk unmindfully. He said, walk mindlessly. <laughs> I'm like, I just had a laughing fit. And he's like, what's so funny? And I'm like, well, you don't know what I do, but it's like, I like teach mindfulness. And he said, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know what anything is. I'm just wanting you to walk mindlessly. And I said, I can't walk mind mindlessly. I've been walking mindfully since 1975. Like I can't, I can't, I don't think I can do it. But it was really, to me, it was one of my funniest moments. I think about it a lot. Like when I'm walking, you can, you can, if you practice long enough, it's not like going to be like you can decide not to be mindful right it's just so funny you know and yet i'm trying to learn something about what he's telling me right he's trying to tell me something that he's observing he and i think he's trying to say that i'm trying too hard and um so i've really lightened up and everything i've heard so far about what a physical therapist would say and um, just kind of hope it works so that he feels better about it himself <laughs> It would be great. <laughs> Do you see what I, I hope I'm coming across with something here? It's like, it's um, if you've practiced a lot and you're learning how to play the guitar, there'll be times when the practice will kick in and and times not. But when you're learning to do something new like that, it's usually not going to kick in as much as you'd like for a while. I don't know, Jesse, you, you're always picking new things to learn. So I'm not that, you know, I'm not doing that as much anymore. <laughs> I'm just trying to walk down the steps, right? I'm not trying to learn how to play guitar anymore, but what is it like? I've We may have keep veering away from the original question, but I, I do have a funny story, which was <laughs> okay. which is related <laughs> to the guitar, which uh, there's these body workers who, you know, they come here once a year or so and, um they're great and they uh w one of them was telling me a story about a time when they were in new york city and um there through a friend of theirs this professional guitarist was about to have this concert i think at like carnegie hall right like just you know top quality classical guitarist and uh the morning before the performance had this horrible spasm back spasm and um somehow they kn knew someone who knew these body workers and so they were called into this emergency situation in the morning before the uh you know before the concert to help this guy out and basically they said they spent hours like just kind of like you know in their method it's like kind of going like a little 
entanglement by entanglement, you know, at the sort of different layers of the body and unhooking this and then unhooking it down here and then unhooking over here. And, you know, this like many hours long process of sort of just like breaking down all the places of sort of like, you know, kind of entanglement and and tension in the body. And after several hours of this treatment, they've kind of finished and the guy just felt amazing. You know, he was just like, I haven't felt this relaxed and comfortable and fluid and in years. And so then before they were about to leave and he said, well, let me just get on, you know, play my guitar and just see how it is. And so he picks up his guitar and he couldn't play at all. He, he was totally disoriented, right, physically in terms of being able to like play this instrument that he was, you know, master at. And that they realized that it's like he had learned to play and over many years with with the condition of all this entanglement in the body and related to the mind and um and that without that there was like no familiarity actually with the instrument and with his ability to play so they had to actually get him back on the table and kind of re lock in all of these like problems you know uh to the point that he was sort of like back you know contorted enough to be able to like play his instrument and I think that there is something in there that describes like kind of how closely related these phenomena are, but also how different they are, you know, and that whether it's an instrument or just like how we drive or, or how we, you know, anything that like a PT or, you know, just like, a, like our occupational therapist, so it's like just how you go about your daily life and the way you do things is so deeply integrated into very powerful patterns of of mentality and physicality and it's a the process of kind of like changing those patterns and trying to find healthier ones and ones that you know are more effective for us is is um you know possible but it's also has nothing to do with how kind we are you know or how much we realize the nature of reality um to really understand that there are different processes and it's not that there won't, won't ways that they influence one another right you can imagine that a fully enlightened being as you know maybe going to have a little more kind of physical ease no matter what is happening for sure but to to recognize that these are um different processes and that no matter what we do we tend to do things in the same way and we tend to reinstill the same patterns in our behavior, whether it's eating or cleaning the dishes or playing guitar or, or whatever we do for our work, right? There's, there's sort of habits of being that are, you know, um, very powerful tendencies, you know, and, and sometimes these activities can be ways that we learn about them and, and do start to untangle from them mentally, emotionally, um, but the degree to which we're sort of learning or untangling or changing patterns physically is, is also kind of a different process, you know, different, but obviously resonant. I don't know, Richard, what do you think of all that? Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're a robot when we're being mindful. It's the opposite. And it includes clear comprehension of purpose so that if you're driving and you see a red light, you have to like <laughs> realize that you're going to have meaning with the color red, right? You, you have meaning with the color green. You have meaning when you're turning on the water from warm to cold. There's a lot of aspects of um, mindfulness that includes clear comprehension of purpose that includes a conceptual understanding of the meaning of reality so it's very important to see that this the mindfulness means that we understand that there's not a personal self um, there's not a me or a mine or an I touching the steering wheel it's sense you know it's physical sensations it's you can still function very well as a human being with the um, clear comprehension of purpose so it's very important We'll do our best. Yeah, that's not, yeah, it's we, not always seamless.
Well, Michelle? Yes. What do you think? I think it's great. Sangha. <laughs> Very happy. Mm. I hope everybody has a good week. Mm. Yeah. Happy birthday, Thank Michelle. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care, Happy everybody. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs>